Welcome to another episode of Just More Fix. This is James. With me in this episode is Lacey. Hey. You can find us online at justmorefix.com or on Twitter at Just More Fix. If you like us, head over to iTunes or to Google Play and give us a rating and a comment. In this episode, we're going to talk about making your RPG into a creature feature. And now, it's time to get our gaming fix. I'm Brady Berserker. I'm Big Sexy Brian Bales. And I'm Metal Matson from Super Geeky Playdate. A podcast member of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the show you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual host. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And get ready because geekiness begins in... Three, two, one. Welcome to the episode of Just One More Fix. A couple quick announcements today. One, uh, first off, our... Patreon is live, Woo-hoo. running right now as we speak, so you guys can head over and support us at patreon.com slash just one more fix. That's all one word, like it always is, everywhere you find us. And uh, there's several different pledge levels there. Uh, we're still working on content getting up on there, and that should be coming up in the next week. We've got some actual plays that we have done that I, we intend to release there. We're also going to release our unedited shows there in case you're edited in the raw audio of us where you hear how bad... My verbal tics are of saying so and um and all that kind of stuff. And you're amazed at how much I sound exactly the same. Oh, not quite, not quite, not quite. <laughs> oh, I derailed your thought train. You did. Booyah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but also, the there, like I said, there's going to be some audio play, or not audio plays, actual plays that we are going to put, put up there. And I think those will probably get released in time, but they're going to come out on the Patreon first to give anybody that wants to support us there a early look at them, I guess. Does this mean we actually have to play games? I think we do have to play games again, don't we? Uh-huh. Man, that sucks <laughs> so bad. So lots of content to come from there. It should be just a matter of me getting things uploaded. They're already pretty much done. I've got to run through filters through them and then extract the files, blah, 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 text speak. But it won't take us too long. They should be coming up this week. Along those lines, big shout out to Todd Olson. As we record this today, uh, the day after it, our Patreon has gone live, uh, he is our first Patreon supporter, so big shout out to Todd W. Olson. He also follows us on Twitter, and Yay. I think he's on our Facebook group, thanks, too, Todd. because he is three times the awesome. So big big thanks to you, Todd, uh, for supporting us. So yeah, everybody should go out there and join Todd and yeah. be awesome like Todd. <laughs> be like Todd. <laughs> and, and help support us, and that would be great. We're going to make a meme about Todd. <laughs> right on. In addition to that, we are still working on getting our schedules uh, worked out to go and do some live recording at some gaming stores. In here in the Indiana, Illinois area, and maybe even Kentucky, and hopefully we will be coming to a gaming store near you, and you guys can come out and meet us, put a name to a face, maybe play some games with us and that kind of stuff. Uh, We have gotten our audio recording equipment sorted out. We got some new equipment that is teeny and portable and awesome that we're using right now. Like James Bond. That's right. And we will be bringing that out there to meet with you guys and play some games and have some good times. The last announcement is that we have uh, some interviews potentially scheduled and uh, some more actual play possibilities ran by the designers of the games, which is super exciting to me because while I think you should be able to take a game and break it however you want, I also think there's some value in playing the game with the person that made it so you can see how it was kind of intended to work, right, and what their actual vision was. So I'm kind of of two minds on that one. That's a big discussion you see all the time from people, and I'm like, well, yeah, you should totally break it however you want, but yeah, you should also do it as as... It was intended to, especially if you have the person that built it, you know? Like, if you're breaking it so much, then probably what you really want is to just play a different game. Well, maybe. But I mean, like, maybe a little tweaking here. It's like all the people are like, oh, yeah, I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons, but I did this, this, and this. (laughs) You should probably just play something else. (laughs) Well, that's kind of how I am with Lamentations, I think, like, for me now with Fifth 5e, which I haven't really... We played it a little bit. Isaiah ran a game, and it was cool and I had a good time, but I also feel like I could just do the same game without all the extra stuff that I don't necessarily need to have and, and play Lamentations. Now that we're talking about planning games, I suppose it's time for us to jump right into this little Ace Ventura there. I saw it coming. That's exactly what I was I saw thinking it coming. <laughs> No. Uh, the mic won't pick up my butt speak either. That's too bad. <laughs> All right. We talked a couple episodes about ago about building better monsters and continuing with our Halloween-themed month here. We thought it would be cool to do a creature feature game. 
but we don't want to talk more about building better monsters because we've kind of already done that. We might touch on some little aspects here, but what we're going to actually do is build a couple kind of uh, campaign frames or games to actually make them as a creature feature, right? Yeah, I think that's what we're doing. Okay, cool. You're just sort of staring at me. I wasn't sure. <laughs> that's just my face. Uh, cool. Fair enough. <laughs> so real quick, I think we're just going to lay out the kind of the basic plot points of a creature feature of how it kind of goes. And then we'll jump right into sort of um, figuring out our little creature feature games here. So the first piece of it is, is almost every single one of them is the very beginning of a movie. And it's every horror movie is that you have to establish the normal normalcy of the world. The, the world is very, I don't know if bland is the right world, but not supernatural, not nothing out of the ordinary going on. There's no giant creature eating people or anything, right? And then the second step is there you have to create some doubt. So something is off. Something has happened. There's people that aren't acting normal or people that are disappearing. Just something is something is off, right? And sometime in those first two steps, you can incorporate some sort of moral transgression that has mm-hmm. happened um, if you if you want. You don't have to, um, but you see that, um, what's a good example? Jaws. Jaws is a good example of that where, you know, the mayor wants to keep the beach open, yada, yada, big, bad, terrible shark. Right. You see it a lot in sci-fi films where, oh, the scientists, their curiosity <laughs> should not have done this thing. It's gone You see it in far. Jurassic Park. You see it in- Yeah. All of those all, kind of things. All of the sci-fi movies, mm-hmm. basically. All of them. <laughs> Along with that moral transgression and the establish of normalcy and a little bit of doubt, there is someone who is in the know. And oftentimes they kind of come off as a crazy person. Maybe they're the hermit, drunk, crazy guy or the old wise woman crone sort of character. But there's someone who knows something is wrong and they will come to the protagonist or the players in our case to say, hey, something's not right here and I know it. But there's not quite enough evidence there or their opinion isn't doesn't carry the weight that everyone else's does. After that is... Usually they're a little bit crazy, too. Yeah. Like, there's some sort of thread of... I don't want to, like, not deniability, but you know what I'm instability. saying. Instability? Yeah, there's some sort of thread of instability. There's something that, something that threatens their credibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, in your creating doubt, you have that, okay, well, they seem to know what's going on, but really, they're just a crazy old person. So, the example that comes to my mind with this is in the TV show, The Strain, and you see uh, the older guy that remembers this happening oh, before, and he's he's fought uh, the big bad yeah. before, but everybody's like, mm, nah, old man. Crazy old you're, dude. You're just nuts. Right. <laughs> right. If you haven't watched The Strain, it's worth watching, and it's good. The books are even better. I listened to them on audiobook, and they were really good. From Guillermo del Toro, awesome horror guy. All right, so after we've created this doubt, eventually things happen, and the plot continues to build, and there becomes so much evidence that it's just undeniable. And there's no way around it. Everyone knows at that, or all the protagonists at that point know that something is wrong. Now, everybody in the world of this movie may not know yet, but it is undeniable for the protagonist and they have to do something. And if they don't do anything, that means death. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like stasis equals death thing. So this is kind of like the moment in Stranger Things where it's no longer just the children and the crazy mother believing it's a thing. Now the sheriff is on their side too. So then after that, we have this sort of things become so out of the ordinary. It's like the antithesis of normalcy. This piece involves the protagonist going into like the other world, going into the whatever the realm is of the creature, right? So, so we talked about that in our Making a Better Monster, right. very specifically when we were talking about Pinhead mm-hmm. and when we were talking about the the bad guy from Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah, the guy with the hands. Mm-hmm. So hands. fairy tales is the the best example, but sci fi does this very well too. In Jaws, you see it yes. when they leave the beach and go out, out onto into the water, the ocean, and they're so far away that they're all the way away from land. They go underwater, and Jaws is a really good example of this. If you're playing a game that isn't a high fantasy style game, it's more of like a modern, mundane world because there's nothing out of. I mean, Jaws the shark goes a little crazy, obviously, but it's a very realistic movie in a lot of ways. I mean, that's what makes it so scary in that, like, the way the shark attacks and they're in the water and all this. So that's a great example of if you have a game to really mine that for ideas and how to do things in a world that is not so fantastical or mm-hmm. mythical. 
And if you want to do the stereotypical high fantasy, this can be actually going into the dragon's lair yeah. or whatever creature. Maybe it's a minotaur in a maze, right. labyrinth sort of situation. Going into but, Mirkwood, going into the dungeon, going in actually into the underworld. That's one of the big things I always say. It's just going into the other world. You get the point. There's a very obvious, not just metaphorical transition. It's mm. usually a f- actual physical transition from setting A to setting B. Right. And while they're in setting B, in the in the un- other world, you have to raise the stakes. And at a certain point, they will realize that if we don't solve this problem, it will be a problem not just locally here. It will be a problem everywhere. So an alien, when they realize that the, that the space station is headed back to Earth no matter what they do. So they have to fix this problem. It's not a problem that they can just let go. In Jaws, they realize the shark could just go wandering off somewhere else and attack people elsewhere. There's, It's all over the place. It's, in Monster Club, they realize that Dracula is going oh, to open God. a spinning vortex of doom that's going to destroy the entire universe. Yeah. So moving, moving, moving right along. Don't you, don't you dare. <laughs> and after we've raised the stakes, obviously it kind of comes to the climax where it's uh, time for a final confrontation with the creature. And oftentimes there is one specific way to kill the creature. A stake to the heart. Right. A severing of the head. Fire is a common one. Having the virgin read the sacred text mm-hmm. to close the portal of doom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's some <laughs> there's some critical thing that is very specific in how they how how you defeat the the creature in that you can fight them back with guns and swords and knives or whatever, but that's not going to ultimately destroy them. You can kind of push them back and fight them, but you're not going to destroy them. It's just not possible without this specific tool. And you can subtly change the tone of the story, maybe not so subtly, by getting rid of that last part and making your creature undefeatable, like you see with the Hellraiser movies. Or you could argue that you see that with Michael Myers. You mm-hmm. continue to stab him, and you think he's gone, but now next Halloween he's Turns back. Out not, not <laughs> gone. Now, I will say you do need to be careful with that if you go the Hellraiser route. Maybe there's something that has to be fulfilled for him to leave, which is, could be a cool moral choice if you have to make make a sacrifice of something to them for them to go away. Uh, but I would just be careful with that because you don't want to put it into a spot where... No, you don't want like an overarching epic storyline where your characters are always doomed to failure because they can't defeat the big bad guy right. even if they want to. Like, that's not right. fair. But <laughs> And if you're going to go that route, then you need to seed those ideas that there is a way to make them go away but not necessarily defeat them over and over and over again so that it's very clear so that your players can have no doubt that, well, while we can fight them a little bit, that's not the way we're going to win this battle. You sort of see that same concept in the Cthulhu Mythos games as Mm -hmm. well. Yeah. After that, it's pretty much the uh, roll credits and everybody gives high fives and we killed the monster, right? Unless there's no one else alive and then there's no one to high five. True, true. Which would be like an alien. And then you sort of do like a a fist bump. She's like all by herself with the kid. I guess the kid's there, but... Okay, so let's start our first campaign frame here. So now, if these suck, (laughs) it's because we're just kind of spitballing here and we're going to try and see what we can come up with. But I do think we have kind of some uh, good experience with horror and I think we'll come up with something that's actually pretty all right. So I kind of spent some time today thinking about something I want to do that was a little different. I, on the other hand, spent zero time thinking about this. So let's let you go first. (laughs) Okay, right on. So I didn't want to do a regular, like singular creature like you would have in Jaws. So I thought it would be cool to do something that involves a group of creatures, more or less. Something along the lines of Invasion of the Body Snatchers is what came to mind for me. Because that's like one of the original, cool, creepy creature flicks that I think that I can remember seeing. So 30-second synopsis of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Go. So Invasion of the Body Snatchers comes out in 1956, so it is black and white. And I I, I watched it today on YouTube. It's so old that I think it's... Uh, one of the public domain movie kind of things. You better hurry up. That's like 10 seconds already. Right. You haven't talked about the movie. So there are aliens <laughs> that are showing up that are replacing people, which is why it's called Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And people are like, hey, I think someone, something is wrong with my dad or mom or whatever. They're not acting like themselves. And they're replacing people in the city, and it's going to continue to grow and eventually take over the world. Uh, drama ensues. They fight. And it's like a regular horror movie. Lots of scares and good, good moments there. And then they win. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I guess. So... And that's essentially the premise of it is that there's aliens coming down to replace people and take over the world. My thought was that we could, I wanted to, I think we'll set something up here in like more of a D&D fantasy style world. I was kind of thinking uh, to establish n- the normalcy of the world, maybe 
you've been running this fantasy game for a little while, so maybe you started off at first level, and now the characters are like fifth or sixth level, right? And okay. they're on a journey back home, maybe. They've, they've accomplished some quest, right? This is a thing that you could do in between two major campaigns, right? So you've ended your hero's journey. Right. <laughs> and you're, you're headed back, and... They stop at like an inn or a small town that they'd been before, been at before, and I thought it might be even be cool to have it where uh, you go back to like the first dungeon that they went to, right? And that they were in the town, like the little village that they went to before they had their first real adventure. Okay, and they stop at the inn. This would be the part where I think where someone comes barging into the inn and says something about the the crazy person who's in the know, right? Is mentioning how something. Let's call him Larry. Larry. Always with Larry. <laughs> Do you think he should come busting in at this point? Like after we've we've met at the inn, I think we we like have them come back. They're at the inn. Maybe they reminisce. Hey, remember this is the place. You know, like maybe the, you know, like as the game master, you remind them this is the place you came back to after the first adventure. It was so cool. Like that sort of nostalgic montage moment. Yeah, and I think it helps to have it on on the home ground because, like you said, the establishing normalcy thing, and it's after a campaign, so you're not really expecting anything to happen necessarily. Right. And if you really spend a little time there, like eating and drinking and letting people tell stories as right. they do once you get to the end, mm -hmm. then you really kind of set it up for maximum impact. Right. At which point, I think you have your crazy person come busting in. So, our someone in the town, maybe that they. Hmm, I guess if you had an interaction in the town with a person who was a crazy old coot or the old hermit in the forest or whoever, then you could... Um, a drunkard works really well. Right. You could sort use them in again. inherent lack of credibility right. in that profession. <laughs> <laughs> but you could use them again if they're, if you, like, if it maybe it was like this sort of nameless NPC from before, but you could recall that character again and they'd be like, oh, yeah, it was the crazy drunk guy again. Here he is. You know, talking about how the people out at the mine are acting weird or whatever. And maybe we should establish the monster as well at the beginning of this so we can kind of walk through well, whatever the problem is. So let's back up and establish our monster. Well, that's part of what makes it discredible at the beginning, too. It's part of what sees the doubt is you have to mention the creature in the beginning. Because if you start with, oh... Well, five kids went missing in the woods. Everybody's instantly alarmed. And so people are going to want to do right. something about it. But then when you end that statement with they were eaten by a horrible half goat, half shark creature roaming the woods, people are like, eh, okay, have another one, Larry. <laughs> well, it depends on how many monster manuals you have. Because <laughs> they'd be like, wait a second. That's the, the half goat, right. half shark, half man. The on. normal townspeople, though, are going to be like, <laughs> right, right, right. okay, yeah, that's not a thing. Right. Our children are just dying from dysentery like the usual. <laughs> right. So I think to set this up, I was kind of thinking it would be something in the earth that would be released. And I don't know if it's because I've been on a Veins of the Earth kick and I've been reading some underground stuff that's kind of got me in this groove. But I think maybe like there's an earthquake, not a giant one, but like a small tremor, and it releases whatever this creature is that's that's beneath the ground and sticking with the invasion of the body snatchers idea it sort of takes over people's personalities right now i hadn't decided do you think it's better if they take over the body or if they replace the body and grow a whole new one which do you feel like is creepier because i kind of thought you could have a whole scene where they would find like the actual bodies in cocoons or something that could be really weird and creepy. Yeah, but I feel like the creature feature lends itself better to actually just taking over the physical body. Because once you start talking about replacing bodies, mm -hmm. you've gone away from the creature and into the villain mastermind kind of territory. Okay. Okay. Because to me, the creature feature doesn't have that same level of sentience. Well, I, I was. That's when we were talking about like. Kong versus Planet of the Apes. Right. You know well, what I was I mean? also thinking it could also be more like a bacteria thing in. In mindset where there's not some overarching plan of them. It's just they spread and they take over and they keep going. Not that there's some more villainous side to them. The idea that just sort of like dehumanized, not personal. They just take over whatever they encounter. Do you still like the other going the other way though? Just taking over the bodies? Yes. With that? Okay, right on. So we'll stick with that. Very cool. Or exploding out of them like an alien. Uh, no, no, no. I don't want to like go. An infestation and then they're like. Brah! Right. When they go, when they finally meet their final form. <laughs> We've had this earthquake that happened, and it released this entity, this creature. So is it going to be like a spirit? Is it going to be like a, uh, something like a spirit and like it possesses the body? Or is it like a bacteria-style thing? Or 
Why does it always got to be a bacteria? Fungus. Why can't it be a fungus? Yeah, the bacteria gets such a bad rap. It should be a fungal infection. <laughs> well, funguses are what crazy about a scary. a parasite, like a flatworm. <laughs> like X-Files style, mm-hmm. where you get the weird worm guy in the sewer with the sphincter face. <laughs> Right, so we're going to go with like a worm creature then, some kind of parasite, because parasites are gross anyway. Like in the the strain, you see it in the strain. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have these worm creatures, and they exist underground. And I thought, I like to, like my players know that I like to purify things by fire, right? That's very clear. Uh, A lot of Warhammer 40k and Call of Cthulhu, Trail of Cthulhu has established that, I feel like, that I'm big on purify with fire. And I thought it might be fun to kind of turn that on its head. And maybe fire doesn't hurt them in that they exist underground so deep that they thrive on that heat. And in fact, that if they're not acting as a catalyst for a reaction as opposed to. Yes. The cold will actually like in terms of like casting spells or something, cold would do double damage on them or something. Or maybe if it was wintertime. Then when they uh, they couldn't be exposed to the snow or anything like it would instantly kill them right. Is I that- like the cave worms thing too because it's sort of dark there and it it doesn't necessarily imply an anaerobic sort of organism, but mm-hmm. you could see where they need to like burrow into something else because they're not used to the open air oh, right, environment. Like you know light. what I mean? Yeah, like. So if they're left out too long, they die, but Mm -hmm. they've got to get inside of something. to Right on. That's cool. I like that a lot. I think that pretty much establishes our monster, right? Then there's no real goal for them other than to just proliferate and spread, right? There's There's no greater intelligence. There's no hive mind. They just understand survival, and they understand proliferating. Right. Yeah. It's the basic, you know. Okay. Eat, breathe, sex. Right. Now, we need to establish some kind of symptoms that these infected people would, like, uh, exhibit. I think what my favorite ones are. What's that? Uh, just general flu symptoms, because it could be so many other things that it, it, it lends itself to your seed of doubt really well. So, like, right. you know, like, body aches, cough, headache. Fever is perfect, because we've got this increase in heat. So when they go inside the body... They make the temperature of the host rise so that they can maintain themselves and reproduce. So our characters, not char- well, the people in the city that are infected, they've just got this fever. They're always hot. If it's in the winter, if your game it takes place in the winter, maybe they're always, you know, oh, it's so hot. I'll take off my jacket. I don't need my jacket. I can just wear my tunic. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Right on. So besides the the flu like symptoms, that's like the initial stage. So like that stage one would be like flu like symptoms with high fever. So what would our our second stage be? This has got to be something where it would still have a shadow of a doubt, where it's not like 100% convincing, but like, oh, that is that is weird. Something is definitely not right, you know, but not, you're definitely infected yet. Uh, interesting rashes are a good one. If you're doing the high fantasy, low tech time period, <laughs> wicked bouts of diarrhea are pretty easily explained <laughs> away. Um, right. You could add some sort of odd appearance to the stool or an odor. That would be really brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So we're going all body functions here on this. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> it's what I do. Okay. Now, now, I, okay. So here, here's something we might need to clarify, though. So we work, both of us in, in the in the medical profession, right? And these are things that we deal with at on a daily basis, and it kind of creeps into your life about you know things you joke about or whatever, and it's crept into some of our games as well. But do you think that in the average person's game that they would that your players would be like, wait a minute? Uh, why is Game Master Daryl talking about old dude's bloody stool? That seems a little weird. But it should seem a little weird because it should be like a little red flag, like maybe something else is going on. Okay. And also people find it disgusting, so I feel like you should discuss it at length (laughs) at your gaming table (laughs) just to make your players uncomfortable. And also if you have a character (laughs) in your your group who's a healer, and this would even extend into... Fantasy games, because, you know, while they may not be physicians and have extra diagnostic equipment, they still have a basic understanding of dysentery. Mm-hmm. And and at this point, you're at stage two. So it should be more plausible for someone to be able to make a role to know that something else is going on. Mm-hmm. I like that. And then you can also have some devout, some larger doubt of, is this just like the plague coming or is this something larger? And then stage three, what do you think? Should we, do you want to do something more like Alien where there's, a metamorphosis that happens and they, they destroy the host and take over? 
I mean, I'm going to leave it up to you because it's kind of like you're leading this thing. I, I like kind of just keeping them as worms. But <laughs> if you want to metamorphosize them, it's, it feels more, uh, I don't know, creature featurey, I guess. To Or you could go like full out like zombie ant fungus and just have it no, take over their mind and have I them walk around I like I like the idea giant. of Men in Black, the first one, where the roach was in the guy's skin, Vincent D'Onofrio's character. Mm-hmm. And... It doesn't really ever come out, but it's just so packed full of these fireworms that it's not even its own thing anymore. And maybe there's a hive mind that happens inside the body, but there's not a hive mind that happens but from from body to body. Does that make sense? So like the worms inside of one person are working together to accomplish some yeah, goal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, and, and just still predominantly being survival and proliferation. But like once the worms go out into another body, then they start their own hive mind. Now, I think that they would cooperate with another infected person because they would be able to tell that that's an infected person. You're basically establishing colonies much in a way of like bees, where there's coordinated work in order to, you know, proliferate the the colony itself. And maybe once it gets so big that then one bee will, one worm will leave and go infect somebody else and start its own colony and, 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 and. But they don't compete against each other because they're all trying to proliferate still. This is really god awful and creepy. I think our stage three infection where they're fully gone at this point i think at stage two it's important to mention that they can start to act like their personality might just start to dissolve a little bit maybe they have some hallucinations and that could be attributed to the feeder fever and also still be attributed to the just the overall sickness of being dehydrated but at stage three right we're full on not talking right i would i would liken it i think like that men in black at thing is a good example of it where he's words aren't there and he's like yeah yeah that sounds good that's right you... and there are several noticeable uh, neurological tics at that point right, how so it moves. yeah very herky jerky movements holding himself at odd angles his right. his gait the way that he is walking it is n- no longer natural in any sense it's more of a lurching almost zombie sort of right. uh gait I, it's just really You can tell that something is wrong with that guy, right? Not that he's sick. Something is actually wrong with him, and we need to get rid of him. Okay. So I think that frames in our monster pretty good there. Would you Would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. So let's walk us. Let's walk through this the basic scenes of this story. And I think, like any story that you would take, you might need to add some scenes or lose some scenes. But this is just a basic framework that you know to work from, and then sort of ad lib and make whatever you would work from from there. So we talked about establishing the 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 baseline of the town. And we've got the crazy person that comes in there and mentions something. I'm going to ask a, a quick question. So let's say you're framing this from the, the D and D perspective uh-huh. or um, high fantasy style game. So are these worms going to be just a true neutral, like any other animal would be, or are these evil worms in that your like cleric type spells would be effective against no, them? I don't think that they're evil in like any supernatural sense. They're just, we're food to them and they're going to proliferate just okay. like a real f- parasite. You know, there's no. I just thought we should establish that. Right. There's no malice with the tapeworm. It's just a tapeworm. <laughs> I like the idea of that. You Feels know. malicious. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, we've established the normalcy and the crazy guy comes in and mentions something. So, what is some insurmountable evidence that we're going to, we're going to lead the characters into? Like, how do we draw them into this with more and more piling evidence of things? Maybe if we have some NPCs that they interacted with before and they're sick and not feeling well. I was going to suggest suggest sacrificing the children. That's always hard to ignore. Well, I think that's I think <laughs> that's like what be the culmination of it. Mm-hmm. Right. And their their infection process would obviously be faster because they're smaller. An NPC they know is a good, good one, especially if it's someone who is inherently good. Maybe it's a it's a priest or a cleric or something of that nature. Someone who went out there with the goal in mind to help heal these sick peasants. Uh huh. And then they got infected. Okay, there we go. So that's something I don't. I think I forgot to mention. I think it's important that this, when the players come to town, the infection isn't just beginning because then it moves too slow. We need to be at the mid stage of the infection, right? Because then they can. They're going to be drawn into it because otherwise they may just move on to the next town along their road journey. I think it would be okay though if you wanted to drop the early infection plot seed. To start with, so you have like the crazy drunk guy come in and mention it. Then your players go on a second adventure, <laughs> and, they come and back. when they come back, like shit is out of control. Right, that would be really cool if you have the time. Because then to... they have that that moment too, where like, oh man, 
We weren't should have we done here? something. Why well, didn't Why didn't we yes. listen to that guy? You know, weren't we you're, just you're, in the Shire? You're giving him a little bit of guilt. <laughs> right, right, right. I like that. That's sort of like some higher level stuff, though, of planning further down the road, which is really cool if you know the game is going to do that. Mm-hmm. And this is a seed that you can put in there. And whether it comes back or not, it isn't going to destroy a huge campaign. This is a small problem to deal with, right? Or, I mean... Could, Unless one of your players gets infected. And then it could be very large. <laughs> Well, so this priest goes out there to treat these people. Now, I think the initial people that are going to get infected are people that were, we mentioned this earthquake and the release from underground. So there's got to be maybe miners that would be the first people to be infected that would go down there and they could, uh, you could let the players know that there was a vent that opened up while they were mining, whether they mined salt or sulfur or coal or whatever it is they, they do, they mine down there and there's a new vent that opens up you would have your characters in different stages of infection. And I think you have some at stage... This would be a good time to draw comparisons between the difference between like your stage one infection and stage two infection, right? So you've got characters that are mostly lucid, uh, just not feeling well. They're less quarantined. Mm -hmm. And then you have your stage two infection people where they're starting to lose track of reality a little bit and some hallucinations. I think this is a great way to pull in that moment of escalation too, because you have these people at various stages and maybe you have old man... Not Larry, but uh, old man Steve, right? <laughs> right. Who uh, was the farthest down in the mine, so closest to actual moment of catastrophe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're checking in on all of these people and you see that Steve has horrifically murdered his entire family and his brain is gone now. And that can be your moment of, oh, wait a second. <laughs> Something is wrong. Something is very, very not right here. Okay. Our mining foreman we'll say so he's he's a position of some kind of authority and reliability in the town he's the guy that kind of is the mine overseer and he's the guy who was the deepest in the mine and saw this thing happen and was the first sort of like patient zero exactly and that's one of my favorite terms okay our patient zero he was at the quarantine place where we have this kind of like um infirmary sanitarium kind of set up for these all these very specific symptoms right and he was there but he had to go home and he ma- managed to uh, convince them to let him leave but that's kind of one of these why is there an infirmary this is like the dark ages well they'd have some ways to establish the mine owner was like get back to work peasants well but like i'm thinking like there's a miners camp that has basically all the miners are now infected and it's just basically became a sort of de facto hospital infirmary place because everybody's there infected so the heal like whatever local healer that comes to get the players is going to be there and be like hey i'm going out there to take care of these people if there's a cleric or a healer in the party hey can you help me i remember you i could really use some help there's a lot of infected out there it's another way to draw the players into it so they go out there and our mining foreman who is at stage two maybe at the tail end of stage and he's convinced the cleric or the healers there to let him go home and make some kind of arrangements or do something. And that's where we the, our larger escalation happens. And they get there. I think that the, the next logical step, if the once you drop that information to the players, that maybe the the initial healer that, that draws you there is like, hey, well, where did the mining foreman go? He was here. He should be back by now. Something's not right. And that would lead them to go find him. Do you think that's fair to say? Or is that too, I think that's putting too much hinging on that. I think that's fair to say, or you could also say, we're just going to go check in on him to make Mm -hmm. sure he's all right. Even if he hasn't been gone for too long or whatever, maybe you give him permission to just go home and be treated at home. Maybe his, uh, maybe his wife is a midwife of some sort. Okay. Ooh, midwife would be even better because then you'd be infecting babies. (laughs) Oh, that's terrible. I like it. (laughs) Perfect. That's what I like about the stream of consciousness idea of it is sometimes it's just like the ideas that just sort of come out of it is just so great. So I like the idea of the midwife. So he goes home because his wife is a midwife and what, does he help or something or? No, I just mean that she has the skills to care for him at home, whereas other family members may not. Plus it makes her a perfect vector for transmission to the rest of the town. Right on. So he goes home then. Maybe he's not quite at stage two then because then you could do, this would be something you would play with for your own players and see how they take it, right? Maybe he's not at stage two and he can infect his wife and then his wife is going to go out and check on all the pregnant women in the village and infect all of them and their unborn 
unborn babies, basically. And what happens when one of these babies is born with the infection? Is that something even crazier that happens now? Obviously, it's a half-born baby. Exactly. I totally. Totally. Gotta go that way. <laughs> I like it. So that would be a point of like serious escalation that could even go turn this from just like a simple couple game session, couple session adventure into something even larger, right? If you have a a pregnant patient of this midwife that, you know, escapes from town. It's also a fun place to draw in the idea we touched on last game with like the exorcist style movies and or when we were talking about mental health. Oh, right. You know, religion versus science. Mm -hmm. So now you have this baby born with some odd deformities. So now the church is going to be involved because it is that era. Right. And and so now you're going to have this science versus church sort of slowing things down (laughs) in trying to like, oh, no, we got to treat this with the medicines and like, oh, no, this is clearly an evil tainted thing right. yeah and the push and pull that so there could be some in interesting dynamic there if you chose to pursue that right and then you could also have the interesting dynamic of pull push and pull between your players because at that point you need to decide if your character if your priest is capable of casting healing spells does that healing remove disease and do you want to make the distinction between virus and bacteria and fungus because they're two totally different things mm-hmm. well in this case you're talking about parasite mm-hmm you're not talking about either of those things. Like this is actually a, 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 a more itself. living creature that right. is, you know, non-microscopic. So I guess that would be a choice that you have to make in terms of your, the mythology of your world. But I think it would be cooler if it didn't, because if it's just as simple as casting a healing spell and everything's all good, well, that's not really much of an adventure. That's like a thing that you mentioned. Hey, you cured that village with six spells. <laughs> okay, cool. But even if you do want to let them do that you can still challenge those players because you're limited in the number of spells you have to use every day and maybe there's 200 people in this village maybe there's 300 Mm -hmm. you know i i think if you're up against that situation then you just make it replicate faster or maybe even and also healing doesn't prevent from reinfection either oh that's the other thing you could be cool to play on is that maybe you do heal them and while it heals them maybe it makes them more susceptible to secondary infection and maybe when they get infected this time it's worse because it mutates in them because it's been in them already and now it's back that could be cool to play on just a couple ideas there okay i guess it would depend on how you wanted to do things whether you wanted some large confrontation back at the house of the mining foreman if you wanted a larger confrontation there maybe he's stage two and you have some undeniable stuff there that happens I guess it would just depend on how much you wanted to escalate things. But I think the next place that this leads is down into the mine. Well, I think at this point, it's probably a good idea to note that at some point, the infection should ultimately kill Mm -hmm. the host uh, because it's unreasonable for any kind of infection for that not to happen. So So it's the most logical thing to find when you go back is that the foreman is dead for whatever reason whether that's because his wife has killed him because she, you know her worms are superior or the infection has just run yeah, rampant well, and wait killed a him what about well, i like the idea of this exploding gore because like this is what we're coming to our like our culmination where it's uh, insurmountable evidence like we mentioned before and mm-hmm. like this i'm looking for some moment in a horror movie where there's like the, the gore happens moment. yeah it's like oh my god the chest burster <laughs> right so they get there he's there he's still whole And maybe he's capable of some intelligent conversation where it's still him, but I would try and role play up the aspect that he's not right. He kind of has stroke like symptoms are good ones to go with because like if you've seen a person that has those kind of symptoms, it's very clear that something is not not right. Something is really going going on with them. And if you describe that like standing at odd angles, like in uh, Men in Black and whatnot, all those kind of things, and then maybe he has a few lucid sentences that he can get out. Where's your, where's, you know, are you okay? Where's your wife? But I think you need to deliver the idea that his wife, his wife is a midwife and she's not here anymore. She went to see patients. Okay. And then I think you have your moment of your high budget horror flick that happens where he just explodes in gore and these worms go everywhere. Right. I like the idea of either, uh, like vomiting up worms, Mm -hmm. like spaghetti coming out of a mouth Oh, right. or like, um, do, do you remember the old movie? Fright Night. Uh-huh. Uh, and there's the guy that eats all the bugs. Uh-huh. And then at some point, the Wolfman guy ends up clawing open his stomach. And there's just all of these uh, grubs mm-hmm. falling out of this guy's abdomen. Right. Well, what if uh, maybe you can try and draw them into some kind of a fight? Now, obviously, the mining supervisor supervisor isn't a 
force to reckon with that way if you're actually hardened adventurers. But what if the danger isn't hit fighting him? The danger is cutting him and having these things leak out onto you. Kind of like in the Strain movie show, when they cut things open, these worms would come out sometimes. And I like the idea of, well, he's coming at you to attack you, and maybe he's so he's super hot and feverish, and he's trying to attack you and claw at you and bite you maybe, and the more you stab him and cut at him, the more chances there are for you to be exposed to this this parasite. I think that's okay, but in order for that to work, you have to either establish that there's some kind of worm involved in the infection ahead of time, or well, that we you're not then? well, or that you're just not certain how the disease is spread at this point. So any form of contact could potentially lead okay. to infection. Right. Um, either one is okay, but you have to you have to make it known ahead of time that there's a very real danger of you being infected with contact mm-hmm. with these people. Or I guess even if you haven't established that or they haven't connected those dots, if there is something that happens or maybe he does vomit up these worms, if you just have the pure horror of him standing there talking, I don't feel well, I don't feel well, whatever, and then bleh, here comes all these worms out the mouth yeah. and out his ears and nose, maybe some coming out of your eyes. Plus like, things wriggling out of orifices make you terrifying, really yeah. uncomfortable. Especially out of the eye. Like, you know, <laughs> you're talking to him and he looks weird, but like his eye keeps like, was that nystigmus? Is that Nystagmus. what it's called? Nystagmus. Yeah, where yeah. the eyes vibrate back and forth and all of a sudden maybe a worm comes crawling out of the corner of his eye, you know. Right out of the tear duct. Oh, God, that'd be so awful. Like, it's just... Yeah, god awful. <laughs> you you could go totally go that route, and then uh, a really good sneeze could be fun too. Almost <laughs> right. a little comical, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, like he sneezes into a handkerchief, and then like you think for a minute you see something wiggling in there, but I don't know. That, I mean, that's just maybe it's just a giant booger. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> he's you know, like one of the stringy ones. You got to kind of pull out. You know, uh... so there's some cool scenes and moments you could play with in there. I think that would be really fun, and then. Knowing that he's the mining foreman and that he's the most infected person that they've seen, that make they would, should be putting together that he's patient zero, whether they use that terminology or not. And that should lead them back to the mine, I think. And they might want to divide and conquer and split the party and send one group back to the to the mining camp and one group to the to the mine. Either way, however that works, I think the what happens in the mining camp really just comes down to managing the effect, infection. And you could even play with the idea, are these people savable or should we just put them down? And I think that's kind of a cool moral dilemma exactly, to, to, to play them. with. And that draws in what you said before with the idea of the faith-based cleric style thing and morality there versus the the traditional healer logic science side of things and if you're playing an actual D D game i like the idea of this even more because a lot of times your alignment is something that just gets written on your character sheet and you don't have a lot of forced do this or do that yeah. unless you're prevented presented with something actually evil like obviously cleric versus vampire is something like yeah, that undead, like this is right. an actual mundane sort of moral dilemma that you're mm-hmm. posing to your players and kind of force them to actually do Man. those things that they wrote on the top of their character sheet. I really <laughs> want to run this game because I had this conversation <laughs> with a fire chief during the entire Ebola thing when we did training. And that's exactly it. Like, Well, he, it's hard, right? Because a lot of yes. people that go, when you're playing a character that's good, the idea is I want to help everyone. But mm-hmm. when you're looking at the kind of plague outbreak scenario... You have to take the crack a few eggs to make an omelet form yeah. of morality. It's more of a public health you will approach lose. as opposed to, <laughs> yeah, opposed to individuals. So that's a really cool moral thing that you can draw on there and putting your players in a difficult situation. What do they call that utilitarian? Utilitarian, yeah. But, you know, more a more pragmatic approach of just making sure that you you know you solve the problem. It's very interesting to think about too because I don't know not to go down too big of a rabbit hole, but it's a very cool thing to come to terms with where. It was weird when we had this discussion and some training things because we were part of the Ebola uh, assessment group or whatever, right? And you're taught to take care of people just like all your healers and clerics are. Very much the same mindset, but it's not about that person anymore. It's about everybody else and having to sort of shift gears into that. And I think it might be interesting because I think your wizards and those more mental style characters are designed to make that shift mm. as opposed to your clerics, which are like, no, we've got to save them, right? You know? And depending on how 
your party rolls, it, it's you can always up the ante by making it a vulnerable party. Mm-hmm. So now, okay, it maybe it's easier for you to make that decision with it when it's about uh, a sixty year old man, or mm-hmm. we're in this time period, a forty year old man. <laughs> he's on his last leg. Right. You see what I'm saying? Versus ten year old girl, mm-hmm. or maybe it's an older woman you well, know, we mentioned or the, we maybe mentioned it's somebody the... who's important to the town mm-hmm. maybe it's a, a lord or something like that so you can you can very easily up the ante mm-hmm. when you're talking about the specific well, we mentioned the midwife thing. That person that's is. a that's a really easy one to touch on there so small young children maybe she's checking on people that have you know recently had babies or whatever and that's a really cool moral dilemma to put people into at the same time if you're not into those kind of moral choices in your games feel free to gloss right over then that. just leave that out but <laughs> I do think it is a cool choice to put them in, making hard choices and gray morality style things. Okay, now we're going to talk, I think we head into the cave. So we go into the mine. So now you're entering the the other world. Right, exactly. So we go into the mine, and there's, uh, it's for all intents and purposes, it's just a regular old mine. But there, the earthquake happened, and it opened up a small section where there's like a vent that goes deeper underground. And this would be a great place to incorporate the veins in the earth book because it's just so cool the way it talks about that kind of stuff, and there's a lot of cool ideas in there. But As you go through here, too, you should transition in the amount of weirdness that is happening. Yeah. So initially, maybe it's just a mine, but as you get closer to the vent, something is more and more off, whether it's a a color, a feeling, a smell, a temperature, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, you have to make it abundantly clear that you're transitioning from world one to world two. Right. So what do we find once we get, is there anything suspicious? Ritualistic designs or something? (laughs) Well, I think they're worms. They're like a parasite. So I don't think there's like a higher intelligence that way. I think a smell works really well for this. I like the idea of an odor. Okay. Especially since it's dark. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're no longer relying on on seeing something. And we talked about kind of the the terrible bowel thing. It's perfect. And having a certain smell. So they they exist underground where it's hot. That works as long as it wasn't a sulfur mine. Well, right. So you would need to not, not do that. But also, I think it draws in some cool... When you say sulfur to people, that automatically draws their mind to hellish and demonic. It, again, it draws in the this moral dilemma of the priest versus the Religion the versus science. You know, oh, no, it's got to be, you know, hellish and evil. It's it's spells of sulfur, you know, yeah. and brimstone, whatever. So that's... Uh, I like that. That's really cool. So you've got the sulfur smell, right? So once we go actually deep down and we're not in the mine anymore, we, tra- we transition through the vent... What do we find inside the inside this new world that we've entered? Like, what is the home of these uh, worm-like creatures? Like, are there some kind of underground creature that they've they've infected a bunch of that would create a larger problem? Because we need to escalate now at this point, right? So they're going to go in there and they're going to find that we've got to solve this problem because it's much bigger than what we know. So are there like, is there a dwarven colony that was under there that they didn't know about <laughs> until this thing happened? Gully dwarves. <laughs> <laughs> that would be only in a Dragonlance game. Oh, come on. <laughs> but like, do you think that's good or should we use some other other creature, underground creature type that they would infect? I think if you want to use a, like an underground creature that's specific to whatever game you're running. So if it's a D&D style game, maybe you had a pack of kobolds that oh, have been yeah, infected okay. or some other goblins or I like the idea of evil creatures being infected because then it's like oh it's okay to kill these things right but now we've got to wade through and slay hordes of goblins which would if you've got like a sixth level party or something it's going to be easy for them to walk through there and kill them right and that's but that's not the that's not the danger the goblins aren't the danger the infection is the danger right and I think it becomes a cool thing of how do you deal with this and especially we mentioned before Fire makes them stronger. So perhaps uh, if you have wizards there and they're shooting fireballs or trying to set things on fire, this is a good place for that to come out. So maybe when they get hit with a fireball, uh, their body heats up and becomes like red hot, like molten metal. And then all they're trying to do is grab onto the party. I picture like actual explosive growth. Uh, oh, so okay. like, uh, like the Samisi transitioning into the, uh, oh, horrid form <laughs> into the horrid form. So something very similar to that, like an actual, uh, explosive, gnarly, asymmetrical growth <laughs> right. creature. Well, also we're underground. So now the creatures don't necessarily have to be quite in a body the same way. So if they get hit with fire, maybe, um, 
from their arms or whatever, right? It comes bursting out and has this crazy growth. And maybe not like full-on purple worm style, but something along those those lines. I think it's called a grig, the one of the minis that we have with like the the it's a worm but it has like the three feelers on the front of it with the mouth in the center mm-hmm, like style. little fangs <laughs> yeah like but they're like tentacle like like or not tentacle might not be the right word but like oh, i was picturing them with like little teeth on the end no no no, no. they're like <laughs> opposable the appendages okay. or whatever i see not not suction suckers like uh, you know like tentacles but something else however you want to do it <laughs> but i like the idea that they can like grab and latch on and not get them off i think it's just like creepy right but at that point maybe you've created an entire new problem because normally they're not hit by magical fire. Maybe it's the magic as well as the fire that sets that reaction off. And then that's a whole new trouble to deal with right there, right? So basically I just see um, lots of slaughtering goblins and trying to not be infected. And unfortunately, there's no level one suits in uh, in, in Dungeons & Dragons. Right. So it creates an entirely new problem. So maybe you're talking about like reflex save- saves or con saves, to not get infected and that kind of stuff, and then the potential of what happens when a player does become infected. I think you could have a lot of fun in this scenario, too, with light and the lack thereof. Mm -hmm. Because to me, a a creature that lives in the dark and thrives in the dark, probably one of the first things it does when it infects this community is start extinguishing light sources that it doesn't need and doesn't have as beneficial and maybe even harmful to it. Now, I know you said like it likes heat, so so maybe not, but... um, But heat underground doesn't necessarily come from light sources, right? mm -hmm. It's like geothermal. Maybe it's next to a a lava vent or something. A heat spring. Right, so then you don't necessarily have to have the actual light source for this. But so. challenging your players with that aspect, as well as the physical and the infection, like you're really like doubling down on the amount of difficulty. So I think our big movie moment climax, right, that happens underground. Lots of gore and all these goblins, how do we deal with this problem, right? And I think there's only pretty much one way to deal with that. Slaughter, wholesale yeah, slaughter. Right, and just trying to not become infected. So there's like kind of this weird moment of like, ooh, ooh, kill it, but keep it away. I think that's just kind of fun <laughs> when you have like like a 12th level barbarian comes wading in there with this giant sword. He's like, ah, stick, stay back, stay back, stay back. Right? I think that's just kind of a fun. Right, you're not as willing to wade into yeah. the fray and get ambushed like, as you normally would. Like Great Cleave is a lot more dangerous now, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> and I suppose to make things interesting and give the players interesting choices in how they go about fighting, maybe you could um, either give bonuses to saves or whatever, depending on what style of weapon they're using. So if they're using like a great axe, right, and they're just cleaving things in two, that's a much higher risk to infection versus someone who has just like a spear and is just spearing things. Mm, or so, a bludgeoning or a style weapon yeah. where you're not actually opening any outside tissue. Right. So there's some cool choices there. So you know, like... Most characters seem to default to longsword and, you know, big weapons like that, but it could be cool to see how uh, things change. And then you've got to, you know, characters are trying to just find something that just bludgeons and doesn't cut things in half. And that could be um, some cool, intense moments there as well. So is that our climax? And then what happens after, or do you agree that's, do you think that's our climax, our big movie climax there in the basement or in the, in the, uh, in the vent there? Well, I think you're, you're still not entirely addressing how you're getting rid of the worms. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're combating this infected colony, but you haven't really addressed the worms themselves. Like what is, so you talked about like your old person having some, you know, secret knowledge as to how you actually defeat these things. So I think you need to bring that full circle. So how is the party going to actually defeat this? What is, what is the, okay. what is the Achilles so, heel of the worm? <laughs> well, this might be a good place to address what you mentioned earlier. Maybe they can't actually defeat these worms because there's so many of them. It's just like a horde, right? Maybe the old timer knows, you know, when he was a little kid, like three or four years old, he heard stories about how they had the mine on the other side of the mountain and they had to collapse it. And then no one talked about it, right? There like only a couple people knew. And there was some whisper of some, some bad evilness that was down there that possessed somebody right i think he emphasized that possession part of it as opposed to it it made him sick and they collapsed the mind because of it to to lock that evil entity in there right okay do you think that works yeah i think that's pretty good i also like the idea that they're indefeatable in this sense because if you really want to be like wicked gm at this point your village is infected too so you're probably going to have to lay waste to the village that you're currently calling home. And now that makes you just like basically murder hobos. Right. Like that's exactly em- what you are. We brought it full circle. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you not have any connections to start with? Right. We're going to slaughter the few that you've made. Right on. 
I like that idea. That that's really cool. Very much fits in the type of uh, games that we run and play anyway. So, assuming that you don't play more um, morally ambiguous or hard choices games, I suppose at that point maybe while you're down there, they if if you had set someone in motion to trying to discover a cure, that maybe in the time that you were underground maybe they had a breakthrough or something and that they can cure some of the people. But I think it make it, it be important that not everyone is curable. Some kind of special cryogenic therapy. Right. <laughs> Cold therapy. And we, we set them in a bathtub full of ice. <laughs> I think that's uh, probably a pretty cool, good way to go. And then you would just draw it to a close there and you have your high five moment at the end. You know, obviously there's, if you're playing the, the more moral style, you know, moral play game, that there's all these hard choices to make about the the peasants that live there and the miners and all this kind of stuff and what do you do with them, and that may take a while to resolve, but once you've got that resolved, that's pretty much the drawing to a close at that point. And if you want to pull in, like we talked about at the very beginning, the moral transgression, you could very easily do that too. You see this done uh, in Lord of the Rings, where they talk about the the dwarves that lived in Moria, and they dug too deep, and they found something that shouldn't have been there. Right. That that's basically exactly, that's exactly what we what just talked about. Is. Yeah. <laughs> so you could play on like the greed would be the would be the moral play of this whole thing. The greed of them going back in. Obviously, they collapsed the cave once, and their failure to heed history. Right. In that this has already been occurring. Right. Hence your wizened old hermit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right on. I like that. This is very cool. This seems like a fun game I want to play in. (laughs) All righty. Well, do you think there's anything else to say about this one, or does that pretty much wrap that one up? I think we hit the highlights. I think that's very cool. I I enjoyed that a lot. We're actually at an hour now, so I don't know that we have time to do a whole nother... We forgot to talk about experience and party treasure. (laughs) Ah, whatever. Just kidding. Just figure that out. (laughs) You get nothing. You get to live with your lives. You get half of an experience for each worm (laughs) you kill. You get the guilt of murdering all the peasants. (laughs) How much experience do you get for killing a peasant? (laughs) It's listed in some book somewhere. What about if he's infected by 5,000 worms? (laughs) Listen. (laughs) Should drive it down. He's weaker, right? (laughs) Well, do you want to try and do a second one, or should we do that like as a bonus episode for something else? Because we're already at an hour, and I'm not sure. I think we should probably cap it there. I think so, too. So, right on. I think we'll probably do the second one that we mentioned. You know, we had another idea for a creature feature as more of like a uh, an individual creature. But I think that we'll probably come back to that one and maybe do that as a bonus episode sometime. So we're going to finish this one up here. So hopefully this is going to be worth something to you guys. I thought it was very cool and fun to do. I think this is a game I might actually try and develop a little bit and run. Maybe James' Could be next fun. con game. Exactly. I think it actually probably game. will be. It's <laughs> really fun and cool to do. Right on. So as you know, we're part of the Gunny Geek Network, and just to give you guys a preview of one of their new shows, Legends of the Shield, number 205, the Inhumans premiere, the Legends of the Shield director, Stargate pioneer, Agent Haley, Agent Lauren, and consultant Michelle discuss the Inhumans TV premiere episodes, Behold the Inhumans, and those who would destroy us. The agents discuss the painfulness of Medusa's hair, the necessary Inhumans dating app for those cool new Inhuman phones, How we ended up sort of rooting for Maximus, how effective the Inhumans world building was, rundown of the Inhumans powers, and play a game of, as you know, Steve, and that should be dropping, uh, looks like the 14th, so it's already out and it's uh, up now, so you guys can check that one out. Very cool. So check uh, check out Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. It's also on the Gunna Geek Network and you can find them uh, linked at GunnaGeek.com. And proud to say now you guys can support us on Patreon by joining other patrons such as Todd Olson and supporting us at patreon.com slash just one more fix. That's all one word. You can find us on Twitter at just one more fix or online at just one more fix.com. If you want to support us, you can also head over to iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find our podcast by giving and give us a rating and a comment. But the best way you can support us is by sharing us with someone who doesn't know about us and trying to help share gaming with everyone. Aww. <laughs> or someone who knows about us but can't figure out how to download the Yeah, podcast. in the case of Brian. <laughs> sad day, Brian. Shout out to Brian. <laughs> he couldn't figure out where to get our podcast at. And he knows us. How sad is that? <laughs> anyway, I think that'll do it for us this week. Uh, we have our Bluebeard's Bride review dropping. Should be Friday if editing goes well. And... We are going to add one more horror-themed episode that'll come out on November 1st. It's All Souls Day. It's kind of like Halloween lumped in there with October. Plus that, we just like horror anyway. So 
look forward to those coming out to you guys soon. And other than that, I guess we will see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. This has been another episode of Just One More Fix. Music has been provided by Kevin McLeod. You can find him at incompetech.com. You can find us at justonemorefix.com. And follow us on Twitter at justonemorefix. 